So very soon we will be delving into the text of the transcendental deduction proper. But before we do that, and because this is a very rich text with a lot of detail and a lot of different like argumentative strains running through each other, parallel to each other, I think it is useful if we prepare ourselves a little bit more. And so I want to make two videos about what I consider to be Kant's sort of central argumentative line in the deduction. And this is going to have to do with the transcendental object and what we might want to call the transcendental subject or what Kant generally calls the transcendental unity of apperception and how these relate to each other. So in this first video, I want to focus on the object side of the equation. Now, let us recall that Kant's problem at the moment is mainly to show that sensibility and the understanding have something to do with each other, right? We know, this is almost the definition of sensibility, that objects are given to us in intuition. Objects are given to us in sensibility. And now, what we would like to say is that the concepts of the understanding and in particular the a priori concepts of the understanding as they are to be applied to objects, the categories. We want to say that those categories actually do apply to the objects that are given in sensibility. But how do we know that? Right? How can we know a priori that this is going to work and that this is going to be universally true and even necessary that the concepts of the understanding apply to the objects given in sensibility. Because Kant has set up these two elements of human cognition as like radically different, in a sense radically separate, he has to bridge this gap. And this may seem like an almost impossible problem to solve because Kant's, like, the stuff he has to work with is so little. Right? We are not allowed really to bring in anything empirical. We are here at the transcendental level. And apart from some basic ideas about how our cognition works, like basic ideas about what sensibility is and what the understanding is, all that we have is sort of the fundamental idea that we are a subject confronted with an object that we try to think. Right? So subject and object, well, those are very abstract notions. It seems unlikely that meditating on, for instance, the nature of an object is going to help us explain why understanding and sensibility would have to come together. And yet that is exactly what Kant is going to do. So let's see how he does that. Okay, here is the question that Kant could start from. We have sensation but our experience is more than just a sort of random play of like different colors and sounds and things that happen before us. Uh, we actually experience objects, right? And Kant uses the word experience here mostly when he, when he wants to talk about this, this grasp of objects, right? So we experience objects. Now, what is involved in the experience of an object, right? How do we represent to ourselves that what we are aware of is not just a sort of purely subjective play of sensory contents, but that what we are aware of is an object? What is involved in representing to ourselves the objectivity of experience? So that is the question that Kant is going to be asking. How can we or what is involved in representing to ourselves this objective nature of our experience. Okay, let's try to get a little clarity about that by looking at an example. So my example is this pencil, right? And so it's a blue pencil, right? So one way to describe my experience is to say, whoa, I've got these blue sensations. Right, I've got these blue sensations. That would be purely at the level of what Kant might call perception. Um, so I have these blue, ex blue sensations, these blue perceptions. Um, that is something purely like internal. 
it doesn't have any objective validity and unless we do something more with it Kant thinks that it is as good as nothing for us right as good as nothing for us uh, insofar as we are like these cognizing beings who are in touch with a world of objects that is insofar as we are after knowledge right um, so what I usually do, of course, is I go beyond the claim that I have some blue perceptions. In fact, like the very way that I experience this is different. I have the idea that I experience a blue pencil, right? Not just blue sensations, but a blue pencil. Okay, now here is a way we can re-ask Kant's question. What is involved, like what is extra in my experience when I don't just experience it as a play of blue perceptions but when I experience it as a blue pencil right when there is this objective element to my experience by the way this objective element might be an illusion right I mean I might be wrong at the moment what we're asking is what is involved in in having this experience that is objective, right? What is it involved in representing to myself this sensation as an objective sensation? Well, um, here is Kant's basic answer to that. When we ascribe, let's say, a color like blue to an object, what we are doing is we are positing a rule for experience. We are positing a rule for experience. Okay, what does that mean? Well, when I say that this is a blue pencil, right, how am I going beyond the mere claim that there is some like rectangular bluish sensation? Well, among other things, I'm claiming that, you know, if I look away and look back, I'm probably gonna have those same sensations. Right? Unless something else happens, right? Like the basic rule that I'm postulating, my basic rule about physical objects, is that unless they move away or they're destroyed or changed, they're going to remain where they are in the state that they were in. And so it's going to be there again, right? There's this idea of permanence in the notion of, of a pencil, at least. Uh, and of course, with most physical objects, not all of them, but in a pencil, yes. Um, it's not just permanence, right? I also have, I, when I say that the pencil is blue, that there is a blue pencil, I'm making the claim that under certain conditions, it is going to generate certain perceptions, right? I am going making the claim that under like normal lightning condition, lighting conditions, it appears, it will appear blue to me, whereas maybe under like a red, under a red light, it might appear purple or black even to me um, and under you know various other lights it's it's going to appear in other ways to me all of that is part of the incredibly complex rule um, that is my concept of a blue pencil right using the word pencil by the way also suggests that I can like uh, um, use it to create marks and so on and so forth and all of this is involved in the ascription of this property blue to an object that I also ascribe other properties to by, by calling it a pencil. All of that consists in positing certain rules that my experience has to follow, right? It posits not just that I will, as a sort of like wild prediction, that I will if nothing happens to the pencil and I just keep hold of it, if I look at it again, have a bluish sensation, it posits in fact that I will have to have this bluish sensation, right? If there is a blue pencil and if the surrounding conditions are normal, then I will necessarily have a blue pencil, uh, sorry, a bluish sensation. Okay, so when we consider the nature of an object, when we consider what it is that we really mean or, or think every time we think of something as an object, it turns out that what we think are that it is the basis of certain rules
for our perceptions. Certain ways that our perceptions have to be under different circumstances um, in different scenarios. So there is something rule-like, in fact, there is everything rule-like about the very concept of an object. But, Kant is going to be quick to point out to us, sensibility alone could never give us rules. Right? Sensibility has nothing to do with rules. Sensibility just gives us something that is there. Right? It's there, and that's it. Right? There is nothing in sensibility that suggests or is in any way rule-like. And this is, of course, why for a thoroughgoing empiricist, for somebody like David Hume, for instance, and the idea that there are rules of experience is very, very problematic. Because if you are a thoroughgoing uh, empiricist and you think that everything comes from sensibility, then there doesn't seem to be anywhere for rules to come from. And so one of the things that Hume is going to be doing in the treatise is he is going to be pretty skeptical about the notion of an object. Right? It's going to turn out to be a very important question to him why we even think that something like this pencil persists if we don't see it, whether we can think that, what is involved in that, whether this is in any way justified. Um, and Hume's answers are not going to be that positive. So Kant is going to say, wow, this just shows what is wrong with empiricism, right? The idea of an object, the idea, the very idea of a rule of experience uh, cannot come from sensibility, right? It cannot come from sensibility. Uh, because sensibility is not a faculty of rules. So what is a faculty of rules? Well, a concept is a rule, right? The concept of pencil, if I ascribe the concept of pencil to something, if I understand something as a pencil, I am positing a particular kind of rules, or maybe a very complex set of rules, in fact, um, to which the object has to conform, right? It has to exist in space and time. It has to have certain dimensions. It has to have a certain, like, rigidity. Uh, it has to, pretty crucially, be able to make marks on the paper, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Any concept for Kant is a rule. It's a rule in the sense that it, it posits, like, using that concept, applying that concept to an object, posits certain rules for experience. At least that is true when we are talking about empirical concepts. Um, it is also a rule in the sense that when we get, like, different objects, then it, the concept tells us which of them correctly fall under it and which of them don't fall under it. And, of course, this has to do with the rules that the that the objects themselves will actually, you know, necessarily follow. So concepts are rules. Um, and of course, we know already what the faculty of our cognition is that deals with concepts. It is the understanding. The understanding was the faculty for concepts or the faculty for judgments. And that turns out to be, if we think through what concepts really do uh, and what happens when we apply concepts in judgments, it turns out to be a faculty for positing and thinking rules. And in fact, Kant is going to go as far as to say that the understanding is sort of most fundamentally the faculty of rules. So where does that bring us? Well, what Kant has suggested is that if we think about what is involved in experiencing something as an object, right, in distinguishing something, from the perception, from the mere sensation, right? If I say that there's not just this bluish perception, but there's actually a blue pencil there, right? What I'm doing is I am positing a rule for experience. But the faculty of rules is not the sensibility. It is the understanding. And so in every experience of an object, the understanding is necessarily involved because otherwise it would not be the experience of an object. It would be a mere subjective play of sensations. We could never have anything that rises to the level of experience 
we could never have anything that could be taken up in knowledge, right? Because knowledge is this attempt to form this sort of, this, this coherent rule-like um, set of, of, of beliefs, I guess. Um, this grasp of the world that is coherent and rule-like, in which everything has its proper place, in which we can wonder whether something is true or not, justified or not. Um, and none of that could happen if all we had was sensation, like bare sensation, without the notion of an object that lies behind and is responsible for the appearance. Okay, so at least in like the kind of example that we've been thinking of, this empirical example of the pencil, it seems to be the case that for an object to be given to us, it already has to fit within the notions of the understanding. Now, of course, Kant is not making this argument at the empirical level, right? He's not really thinking about glue and he's not really thinking about pencils um, because we are supposed to be doing transcendental philosophy here, right? We are supposed to be thinking about the very idea of subject and object. And of course, it's not part of the very idea of an object that it is blue, right? Or that it is a pencil. So we will have to raise our discussion from this empirical example to the transcendental level. So what do we have like a priori, like when we are doing transcendental philosophy, what do we have? Well, all that we have when we think about an object transcendentally is the idea of an object as such, right? The idea of something totally undetermined, this undetermined object that can be distinguished from the mere play of sensations and that is somehow the rule, right, for this mere play of sensations. Now Kant calls this idea, this idea of an object as such, he calls it the transcendental object or the transcendental object is X, where the big X is supposed to show that we're not ascribing any properties to this, right? So the transcendental object. Now, this might be a slightly unfortunate choice of terminology for Kant. Um, it might have been better. I mean, the transcendental object sounds like they're this weird object, right? It's a really weird object. It is transcendental. What kind of object could that be? Um, there is not something, there's not like somewhere, oh, let's search for it, the transcendental object uh, somewhere in the world, right? That's not Kant's idea. What we are talking about is the transcendental concept of an object or the transcendental thought of an object, right? So we are talking uh, about the idea of an object as such. That is what the transcendental object is. So it's not so much like an object, it's more the idea of an object. Okay, so what can we say about the transcendental object? Well, clearly no sort of empirical rules, in fact, no specific rules at all can be posited for it because there's no content here, right? This comes before any experience. We are in the a priori realm. We are doing transcendental philosophy. So we can't like posit any particular rules for it. So the idea of the transcendental object or this transcendental idea of the object uh, can't involve any rules. The only thing it can involve is the form of rules the a priori form of rules, right? When we think an object as such, we think of it as rule-like, as the kind of thing that when we posit it, we posit rules. And so what we can attach to it is the a priori idea of the form of rules, right? Of the, the very idea of what a rule of experience could be like. Okay, so what is the a priori form or shape of rules? Um, what is this, this sort of a priori grasp that we have of like the shape that any empirical rule could possibly have? It is, of course, the categories, right? The categories are precisely the formal idea of applying the judgments of the understanding that is rules 
to an object, right? So categories are the a priori elements of the understanding, this capacity for rules, as they would be applied to objects. And so when we think the transcendental object, what we are thinking is something that a priori, we are positing something a priori that is rule-like, that has the form of rules, that allows for the positing of rules. And that means that allows for the application of the categories. So in the very idea of an object, and in fact, we can know a priori in any object that could actually be given to us in experience, um, it's going to be something to which the a priori form of rules can be applied. Because that is what objects are. And so we know in advance a priori that any object that could be given to us is going to be able to be thought as falling under the categories. And that, of course, is at least part of what Kant wanted to prove. Okay, so let's try to re recapitulate that and see if anything is still missing here in Kant's proof. So what Kant is, um, has been trying to prove in this particular line of argument is that if an object is given to us in experience, then the very separation of mere perception from object, right, the very thing that makes it possible for an object to be given to us in experience, um, is that it can be thought of as rule-like, as I should probably say the ground for rules. It can be thought of as the ground for rules. Now, in order to think something as being the ground for rules, in order to even experience something as being the ground for rules, I've got to involve the understanding, because the understanding is the capacity, the mental capacity for rules. It is the faculty of rules. So, whenever an object is given to us, it is given as a ground for rules, and that means that the understanding is already a priori involved. We can know in advance that for any object that is given to us in experience, the understanding is going to be involved. Um, in particular, what is going to be involved are the concepts that are necessary to think of something as being a ground for rules, and that is the categories. So if the result of the metaphysical deduction was the following, it was that if objects can be thought, thought, notice that word, if objects can be thought, if we can apply the understanding to objects, then we can apply the categories to them. Right? So if an object can be thought, then it will fall under the categories. That is basically what the metaphysical deduction gave us. And now the line of argument that I've just been given to you has told us that if an object is given in experience, then it has to be given as something that can be thought, and therefore the categories apply to it. And so we have advanced. We have advanced from if an object can be thought by the understanding, then the categories have to be applied to it. From that, we have advanced to if an object can be given to us in experience, then the categories can be applied to it. So we have kind of sort of bridge this gap between the understanding on the one hand and the ex experience, which we might associate in the first instance with sensibility, on the other hand. And that is an important step forward. But it can't really be the end of the argument. It can't really be the end of the argument because this still leaves open the possibility that we actually don't have that kind of objective experience, right? Maybe all we have when, when we really think it through, maybe what we should say is that all we have is mere perception, right? Maybe this whole idea of objects is an illusion, is a problem. Maybe we should go like radically Humean and just deny the existence of objects and claim that there's no such thing as objective experience. All there is is a mere play of sensations. And I'm not claiming that Hume claims that exactly, but that would sort of be a, a radical version maybe of Hume. Um, Kant needs to say something about that too, right? Kant needs to show that no, we actually 
do have experience and we must have experience. Where I, by experience, I mean this grasp in sensation of objects. That is the topic of our next video.